Thanks so much for being here for Moral Mondays, Iowa. Really appreciate you taking the time to be here and to learn a little bit more about um, the budget and particularly the appropriations that hit us in the middle of session um, and in the middle of the fiscal year and have two um, amazing experts on that subject, Senator Joe Bolcom from Miami City and Representative Chris Hall. Very glad that you are here to join us. I want to thank the legislators that are in the room also to, that are joining us, but particularly the, the advocates that are in the room um, that want to make sure that they understand, that you understand um, the issue and that you can advocate on behalf of all Iowans. Um, Moral Monday to Iowa is on Facebook and Facebook Live and Mr. Matt Snowick is um, live streaming that for us and we're thankful for him doing that each week. Um, and you can always like our Facebook page, Moral Mondays Iowa, that helps us out a lot and you can always share that video with folks that um, are uh, not able to be with us. So anyway, we will get at it. We'll, our general format is for our speakers to talk for about 20 minutes and then we open it up for questions and answers. So, Senator. Good, good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. Joe Bolcom again from Iowa City County. Thanks for the invitation to be here. Uh, we're in our sixth week of the session, and we are still uh, fidgeting. Uh, Republicans have a budget crisis on their hands, a result of really the mismanagement of the state's treasury, some misguided priorities that have seen uh, just uh, record spending on tax giveaways, tax exemptions, that have really depleted the state's ability to fund the priorities of the people of Iowa, including education, mental health, uh, public safety, the courts, clean water, you name it, we don't have enough money for it. Uh, last week, the Senate approved their second deappropriation bill. The first one a couple weeks ago uh, reduced fiscal year 18 funding, which is the current fiscal year that ends June 30th by $52 million. Uh, Iowans told them they didn't like what they did with that bill and over the last couple of weeks they reconsidered and presented a bill that cut around 32 million dollars of general fund spending from a whole host of things that Iowans really depend on and want. Uh, and so the, where we are at the moment is we're waiting for the House, Republicans and the Governor. The Governor has her own proposal. Now the Senate has two proposals <coughs> narrowed to one and we don't know where the House is. I think we saw a spreadsheet and Representative Hall will probably give us an update on this, but uh, what we have is kind of a, a really uh, disorganized uh, group of Republicans in this building trying to figure out how to, how to fix this budget mess. And uh, with every day, it makes it harder for state departments and our community colleges and public universities who are expected to absorb an, an enormous amount of this, uh, uh, this cut to manage it in, in with a few days, you know, the four or four plus months that are available to them in this fiscal year. So we hope that they figure this out soon and uh, bring a bill to, to essentially the requirement to balance the budget. So that, that's, a, that's my brief update on, on the budget. Uh, fiscal, or let me say a couple more things. Fiscal year 19, once we figure out the appropriation, we immediately turn our attention to the, the 19 budget, which looks uh, pretty bleak. Uh, I think we're going to probably see more cuts across some things. Certainly the funding that was uh, deappropriated this last year is not probably going to return. Uh, if, if you recall, just about 12 months ago, the legislature deappropriated $88 million out of the 17 budget. We borrowed $144 million in the interim, and now here we are again, cutting anywhere between 30 and 40 million more in, in spending. Again, until we get a handle on uh, the tax credit side of the budget, which is kind of this thing over here that's kind of on automatic pilot, where companies like Apple and, and big fertilizer plants and Facebook get tens of millions of dollars of, of tax benefits while we uh, cut the ombudsman office and tell the state ombudsman you, you're going to have to uh, ins respond to complaints at nursing homes over the phone. You no longer have a budget where somebody can drive and go and check on somebody that needs to be checked on, as an example. So uh, lots of problems in the budget, um, and I think at some point our priorities, the priorities of the Republican majority, are going to have to change, or or uh, they're going to they're going to uh, have some negative outcomes in November. So I'll stop with that and turn it over to Representative Hall. 
Thank you, Senator Bolcom. Um, my name is Chris Hall. I'm a representative from Sioux City, a ranking member on the House Appropriations Committee. And I suppose for my comments that I'll add just kind of an opening, you've probably heard uh, myself and many others over the last year or so try to set up some of the bigger picture in talking about what is not working within the state budget. And it's not always something that's easy to explain uh, to the average citizen. How their budget works, how it comes together, all of those things are a little bit harder for them to actually follow through a legislative process. And so if you hear a Democrat like myself uh, on the news or if you hear me uh, during an interview, oftentimes I'll be saying something about how there's some signs of fiscal mismanagement within the state. And what I might try to unpackage here a little bit better today is what you can't understand in just a sound clip and how, how it is being mismanaged or some of the different signs that I can point to of what's not being well taken care of within the state government. Uh, for fiscal mismanagement, you know, look at the point in our economy and some of the different factors that we should see in terms of operations of state government and whether or not or our budget actually reflects that. Right now we have statewide unemployment at about 3%. We are at a point in time where Iowa's economy, although it is growing slowly, is still growing and our state revenue reflects that. The, the vast majority of state revenue comes in the form of income and sales tax. So if people are working, generally the state budget will reflect that. Um, what is happening right now is unique historically for the state of Iowa. We are in the second year of deappropriations. We are walking into a budget uh, that was created at a time where the economy was growing. And we are actually deappropriating at a point that the state has more revenue available to it than it did the year before. Think about that. So if we have more revenue available to us, we should hopefully be able to maintain the programs that we've been funding. We should be able to figure out where the new revenue can be allocated and where that can be uh, funding new programs or growth in the programs that we know it needs. But when you look at the way that, so, all right, we are deappropriating at a time where the economy is growing. The last two times previous to this that the state did deappropriate were during the global economic recession, which was significant for the state of Iowa, just as it was for every other state in the union, uh, and also following the September 11th tax, where uh, we had a Republican legislature, a Democratic governor, they worked together to figure out what needed to be shored up in order to make sure our, our budget was balanced. But the last two times were actual recessions. Right now, that's not the truth. And when we're talking about the state budget being mismanaged, some of the things that we're talking about are management skills. If there are certain parts of the budget that are growing faster than others, and there are things that the legislature should be able to do to rein in those costs, or if attention needs to be given to those areas, we should do so. Over the last few years, the largest area of growth in our state budget is tax credits. And the Republicans aren't fond of us making this point, and we got into it a little bit last week on floor debate, because they say stop talking about tax credits without proposing any solutions. But the truth of it is that Democrats last year proposed some solutions and some ideas, and we brought them to the table. We actually made a rare procedural move during the Appropriations Committee last year to make sure that our suggestions were included in the minutes so that everybody from journalists to the public to the Republicans would be able to go back and reference our suggestions if we thought you know, they were credible. Um, and when you look at it, the reason that we really propose different ideas and solutions about reining in the cost of tax credits is that from the last year to the present, the cost of tax credits is $119 million more than it was the year before. $119 million more when we're only expected to have new revenue of about 200 and some. So it's eating up a huge chunk of new revenue available to the state. And what we proposed last year were at least some ways that these tax credits would not be automatic, they would not go uncapped, they would not continue to grow in cost to the taxpayer without some legislative check. Um, that's one thing that the Republicans really, even though we proposed some ideas, it seemed like more of a political football last year and they didn't want to acknowledge it. Well, fast forward to the present. Now we are dealing with those costs, we have to absorb them as a state, and Democrats are again saying, let's give some attention to this, let's try to manage it better. The Republican governor, in her condition of the state address though, said, 
I don't really want to deal with this during an election year. Let's have a study commission. Let's come back and look at it next year. And so when we talk about fiscal mismanagement, there are trend lines within our state budget that are not sustainable. They don't fit with the rest of what we need our state budget to be acting like. And it is being ignored and the majority party is preferring just to look the other way and hope that it gets better on its own. Uh, other instances of fiscal mismanagement, I would say, are last year, last fall, when uh, the state budget books were closing. Um, we pointed out, and the state treasurer's office agreed and notified the governor on the front end that the transfer that she was hoping to make to close out our state budget books was actually not in conformance with the law. Um, this is something that the legislature should have addressed. Democrats, by and large, called for a special session in order to have us make that decision as we are constitutionally obligated to do. And instead of doing that, the governor made an illegal transfer to shore up our books. And I would say nine out of 10 attorneys agree with our reading of the law. And shown in the governor's own deappropriations bill is corrective language acknowledging that her office broke the law. There's another instance of mismanagement. Uh, I'll close up just by saying, you know, there are things you can point to and things that should be addressed, and Republicans somehow still have this reputation out there in the public about being able to get the trains to run on time. And that's not true of what we're seeing this session. Right now, we're deappropriating at a time, again, where the economy's growing, but the numbers for this deappropriations process have not changed since October. The October Revenue Estimating Conference put these numbers together, they didn't change at the December meeting, and you have Republicans that have had the same set of budget numbers and they've been able to discuss with their agency heads and departments what needs to change and what needs to get trimmed. They had October, November, December, and January to do this and you still don't have Bill Dix and Linda Upmeyer on the same page. They can't put together a package of cuts, they can't put together any solutions that also help shore up the way that the state is giving its revenue, they're just choosing to balance the budget on the backs of the state's most vulnerable. Last year, as Senator Volcom mentioned, that affected the way that nursing home inspections are conducted. It affected victim, victims of sexual assault, and we closed down some of the centers for sexual assault and domestic violence. Uh, it's affecting courthouses, schools, and all of these other things. And at the same time, that they are ign ignoring, in many cases, the problems that are creating uh, all of these kind of trend lines in different directions, while that's being ignored, um, they are proposing cuts to basic services. Preschool, victims of sexual assault, corrections, public safety, and on down the line. And taxpayers are footing the bill either way. They borrowed $144 million out of our reserve accounts. Part of the reason, as you heard a Republican budget chair say in the last couple of weeks, Part of the reason we can't fund schools this year is because we are paying off the debt incurred by the governor's office and borrowing out of our rainy day accounts. So I know that there are many people in the Republican majority party in particular that would like for me to spell out what's being mismanaged. These are all instances of mismanagement. These are fundamentals that are not being taken care of in state government and it's reflected in the services that we're providing to people. I would add a couple, I mean, I think that the theme here is there's, some, there's a number of things wrong with, with the operation of state government today from, from the, from that's, that come out of the governor's office. And the Medicaid privatization mess is another mismanaged kind of disaster. The, the elimination of the family planning waiver is seen like a 50% reduction in the number of women that are getting health, the health care they need, closure of those clinics. The medical cannabis law that the Republicans pushed through here last year is really, really a mess, right? And I think when you have a bunch of folks running government that really don't like government, this is the results you get, mm -hmm. right? It's the wrecking crew uh, is what we're seeing here in a number of areas. And it is mismanagement without a doubt, but you just wonder what their, the motivation is uh, on how, how poorly some of this stuff is going down. So it's our habit with Moral Mondays for, to open up for questions and answers. And so uh, we have our first question back in the back. Yeah. My question is about reserve funds. I know Chris, you talked about the 15 million she borrowed before, it's illegally done. 
Sure. Is there a way to legally do that? And my question is really to the point, we only have three or four months left of this fiscal year. Mm -hmm. This draconian cuts, is there a way to legally borrow from that $600 million that we've got sitting there? Uh, you know, I, I've looked at the state, co uh, the, the code sections that govern our reserve funds. We are allowed to use them for cash flow purposes, but that's really assuming that you borrow and they are paid back before the end of the close of the fiscal year. So it's true cash flow purposes, and it's when we talk about that, it's more uh, the state treasury, maybe we're sending out income tax returns, and we use that for cash flow purposes, but we know that it's paid back in short time and before the books close. Uh, you have to really have a dip in revenues that fits with code, because the code is built to say, we only can borrow from our reserve accounts if there is a true recession. We don't want to be borrowing willy-nilly. We don't want people to have the authority to borrow from our rainy day accounts unless there is true reason to do so. And uh, I don't personally, not everyone's going to agree, but I don't personally think it's a good idea to borrow from reserves in a moment like this. And part of the reason why is that it ends up compounding the problem out farther down the line, where if we borrow this year, we have to pay it back next year. And that's the moment that we're actually in. The Republican majority borrowed out of our rainy day accounts. Part of the reason that we had to settle for 1% school aid is the fact that we are also paying on an installment back to our rainy day accounts to bring them back up to full. So if we did that this year, we would end up having to do the same thing next year. It would create an artificially tight budget where we're paying off debt and we're not able to fund our priorities. One thought that I have, uh, and again, this is just my own idea, um, but the state is going to see some windfall in revenue this year from federal tax changes. And it's to the tune of about $100 million. Um, the Republican majority has said they're not willing to touch that in any form. I think that we should use that $100 million to pay off our debt. I think we should pay off our debt first, the, the do uh, dollars that were borrowed last year, and that way we give ourselves the flexibility next year that we'll need to fund our priorities um, and we won't have to continue paying things off like the Republicans have us right now. With, with each credit that be, comes before the legislature, we decide whether uh, how it's going to operate. And we, we, we like to get rid of refundable credits, right, for, in general, right? Although there's a, the earned income tax credit, which is really like the, the leading tax policy that's helped raise people out of poverty, it's refundable, right? So they're not all equal, but they're, so you, you've got to, when we pass these things, you have to make a judgment whether something should be refundable or not refundable. And in general, these business credits should not be refundable. And we have uh, one on the books, the, the legacy one, since the mid-'80s, that's quite, it's refundable and it's very lucrative. In fact, in the next three days from now, there'll be a report that the Department of Revenue is going to put out on all the winners of the research activity credit. And th that, that credit goes to like Deere and Rockwell Collins and Pioneer DuPont and 25, 30 other companies. And we passed a law a few years ago that said anybody that got a refund check over $500,000, we'd get a list. So in three days, we'll have the set, like the seventh or eighth annual list, and it'll show Deere and Company, I'm going to guess, is going to get somewhere between 13 and $15 million mm -hmm. of refund and Rockwell about the same. You know, I love, who doesn't like to get a refund? You know, you know, you fill out your taxes, you hope you've paid enough, and you might get $400 or $800. Well, these companies are not only not paying any state 
corporate income taxes because, as in your example, the credit absorbs any tax liability, but then Iowa taxpayers write a check to probably Pioneer DuPont for $6 million, dear. And we've been doing that for the last 20 years plus. Is good forever? Well, the, the, it's in the law. It's good until we change the law. And when people, when people here talk about, and it, it, this particular credit, there's, there's a federal credit just got renewed, and we have a state credit. We're about one of about 30 states that have this credit. And Iowa has the most generous credit in the country because we do not put a cap on, we, it's refundable, and we don't have a cap on its refundability. We could say, we'll continue to refund it, and we'll put a cap on it at a million dollars. If we did that, we could probably save 40 million, 40 to 50 million dollars right now to address some of the some of the budget concerns we have in Iowa. Okay, so that's that's an that's an example where Representative Hall said, "What are your ideas?" That idea has been put out on the table. There's a bill in the Senate to do just that, and we would still have one of the most we would still have in the top five in the country generous credits for the treatment of research going on in our state. And and I want to also just add real quickly, you know, some of these tax credits in, in the economic development or business tax credits that are out there, we're not just putting a target on them because of the idea itself. So many human services have been trimmed back that we're just trying to say, if there's pain being placed on state government, shouldn't there be parity across state government? Shouldn't we at least be trimming back the costs in all areas if we're also balancing this on the backs of preschool children or you know, nursing home inspections and those things? Shouldn't everybody at least feel a little bit of that pain if state government's having a difficult moment? Uh, a recent expenditure involved the uh, business uh, property tax cuts with a guarantee by the state to backfill that loss uh, to uh, make up for that. Uh, is that in jeopardy because of the uh, budget squeeze? I, I believe that there, yes, I believe that the backfill is in jeopardy. Um, Republican leaders at their forums heading into session certainly said that it was on the table. And actually, uh, last year, the Republican leadership in the House had it drafted to phase that out. Uh, we, saw it, we saw it in their standing bill amendment where they phased out that backfill over a period of about five years, which would also probably impact property taxes going up. Right. I mean, that's the result. If you phase out that backfill, most cities are going to have to either raise their property taxes or uh, also cut significant services. But most major cities, have maxed out their rates that they can uh, uh, make for property taxes. I mean, it's gonna, so it's going to, in other words, this, this pain is going to be placed on cities and counties. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. There's a bill in the Senate, Senator Shelgren has a bill in the Senate this session to phase out the back bill. Ouch. I don't think it's going anywhere. But. We have a question back here. Thank you. Your charge that you represented is showing giant corporate tax credits. I think we as a public get it now. It took us a while. Mm -hmm. But I really would love to see a plan. How do we end this uh, misuse, I will say. I mean, I like John Deere's, but wait a minute. I also want corporate citizenry. And with this, and I would really grudge a plan that we can share with our public to answer these corporate tax credits that are way out of line and are hurting our courts and everything else. Mm -hmm. And thank you for bringing me that up. Well, two things. I mean, I, I think we're gonna have a set of programs and we should have a set of programs to compete with other, other states to make sure we, for, for, for employment. I mean, I think you, you talk to people around the state, they wanna see, uh, they want to see programs that do that. I think we want we we can't just not have programs. But I don't think we need the most generous, and we need a process to evaluate these things. And as Representative Hall said, there's got to be a little shared sacrifice here. I mean, we are the budget's in crisis, and we haven't asked for one dollar of sh of sacrifice from from this part of the budget. Um, 
the, 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 I think the, at, at, the, at, the end, at the end of the day, without leadership on this from the governor, we're not going to see progress. I mean, Representative Hall noted earlier in her condition of the state, she said, we'll have a task force and look at this sometime later on. Well, the house is on fire, you, you call the fire department, right? You don't, you don't say, well, let, we'll call them next week, right? It, it's time to get on this because the other thing I'd say, the, the credits are, it takes a little bit of time to dial these things down. I mean, it's not, it's not like we're just going to stop on a dime here. You have to make the policy change. It takes a couple years to see any benefit. So uh, leadership is not saying with every topic, I'll see what the language is when the bill gets to my desk. That is not leadership. And we need leadership on this because it is a hard thing to do to peel these things back. Once you, one of the things I've learned in the legislature over time is once you create these credits, they are just really, really difficult to take away. So you can. Yeah, on the same topic, I think the word that stood out from what you just said to me is evaluate. Is anyone evaluating what Iowa is getting for all of this money? Are we getting more jobs? Uh, are we retaining companies who would otherwise leave the state? Is John Deere going to leave? We have a committee called the Tax Credit Expenditure Review Committee. It meets maybe once, maybe twice a year during the interim. It's been, it's been pretty ineffective. Uh, these are complicated uh, areas to know about when you sit down and you get a report on how this works. We need a standing committee of the legislature that would be like our budget subcommittees that meets for two hours a day, three times a week for six weeks so that members get up to speed on what these credits do, how they wor work. I mean, the Tax Credit Expenditure Committee, we come together for six hours and people talk to us for six hours and you leave and you say, well, I guess I understand how those work, but I don't understand if they're working. And uh, that's a big piece that we, we, we actually need a standing committee where legislate, bunches of legislators get like in, in knowledgeable about the topic. Until we get that, I think it's gonna be really, really hard to get a handle on that part of the state spending. This might border a little bit on rhetorical, but am I right to assume that every time they bring up a new program that's going to cost money, that you guys are sitting there saying no? Well, I, I'm not sure I quite followed the question. I was, but I'm thinking about vouchers. Sure, sure. Oh. So on that, yes. <laughs> I, <laughs> One of, one of the points I've made many times at my forums back in Sioux City, because you know I've got Republicans sitting at the front of the table with me at our forums, and they say, what about this idea, and re we really want to move forward with vouchers. And the thing I remind them of is a fairly conservative budget principle is actually to fund the programs that already exist before you create new ones. And they are proposing new programs at a time that they're actually cutting ones that exist. And that doesn't make sense in terms of an actual management of your budget. Um, I agree very much. And maybe make that point tomorrow. Right? <laughs> Mark. Uh, I understand the judiciary is going to get hit exceptionally hard yeah. on the deappropriation since Medicaid and education is exempt. Uh, there's a hundred courthouses. Uh, who's taking responsibility for how those cuts will be made? legislators to say we told them to spend five million less here's our will be uh, judge katie Chief. or will be the governor i mean when people are unable to complete their divorce or get their protective order our businesses are unable to file transactions because courthouses are closed who's going to be responsible for that um justice katie would likely have to manage that within his own branch of government. Um, and what he told us in his condition of the judiciary address is the first red flag that we should be mindful of as new cuts are being added to it. He's got already over 100 positions and vacancies that have been sitting open. I mean, the judicial branch is already bare bones and they've had to force those positions to remain open and keep people waiting for justice uh, because of last year's cuts. 
And that's been a hardship on the judicial branch, even though they are a separate and equal branch of government. Uh, if we, as a legislature, pass $5 million of cuts on to the judicial branch, they would have to figure out how those cuts occur, but uh, it's certainly not treating them with very much respect or deference as an equal branch. We, la la last year's budget, and we, we're seeing with the deappropriation bill, we're just giving department heads, including the chief, a number, right? And yeah. you, you go figure it out. Well, last year we went home in May, and we, we left DHS and the health department, DNR mm -hmm. directors with these cuts, and they cut stuff, we, we, like we went home, and then the email's coming in saying, why did you cut hearing aids? Why did you cut autism? Why did you cut this? And we, we didn't do our job. The Republicans in charge of the budget are not doing their job when they turn over these funding decisions to, to department heads on this scale. We should have sat down and, and walked through the line items and said, no, we're going to not fund hearing aids. We're going to take the heat for that instead of Gerd Claybaugh, who's got to make the budget balance and cut $1.2 million out of his budget, him having to make that judgment. And, and we're here today with a budget bill on the Stia probes that's going to go through that same process. We, we kind of deflect the, the, you know, people being mad by saying, well, I wouldn't have cut that. The, the health department director cut it. So it's, it's, a, it's a rotten process, I think. Mm -hmm. I need to excuse myself yeah. to a meeting. Thank yeah. you very much for being here. Yeah. We have about 10, 15 minutes left, and we have a couple more questions, and, and Representative Paul will answer. Just to go back to what was discussed earlier, the whole point about vouchers and educational savings accounts. Yeah. My concern is that when we're looking at those, we're talking about the public schools educating up to 96% of the students. And I don't see how we can be talking about uh, educational savings accounts and new opportunities when they already have transportation reimbursement, they already have textbooks, they already have tax breaks. Private school parents already have those opportunities. Right. And to me, it, it doesn't make sense uh, and then I've had some people say, well, all we're going to do, all we're really going to do is we're, we're going to go after um, the 529 for private school parents. But even that's going to take a million dollars. I was a school superintendent for 17 years. And the last few years, whenever anybody would come to me and say, we want to add a new program, I'd always say, no, we don't have any money. Get out of here. <laughs> the legislature and some other people went on enough. I'm not after you. I don't mean sure. that. You're yeah. doing your job. But I always say, this isn't the time. This isn't the place. We can't bring that up. And they look at me and I say, well, that's the way it is. And for me, I think we need to do the same thing right now. I think we need to educate the 96% of our students. I think we need to continue what we have. But the other problem that I have with doing this is that when you look at it, all of a sudden we're saying that if a school wants to do religious instruction in the afternoon that they would be able to do that and the constitution says those are to be separate sure so i think public school teachers and administrators and i'm not an administrator anymore but they have done a really really good job with very little money the one yep. percent new money you're, you're talking about 60 to 70 percent of the school districts in Iowa will have no new money so we need to take care of them and all recognize that we're under the weight of inflation. We need to make sure that we take care of those students, and I think we need to even take the 529 and say, no, not this year. Maybe we can bring that back in the future. Personally, I wouldn't agree with that, but at least to be fiscally responsible, because yeah. we're all trying to be conservative. We're all trying to ride out some difficult times, and to me, that makes the most sense. Thank you. Yes. yes. Other questions or comments? Well, I want to thank you. Thank you for being with Moral Mondays, Iowa. Oh, can I, I just want to make one comment, um, one quick comment. You know, a lot of a lot has been said about the rural economy, and I want to make sure that I at least add a fine point on on something that the other caucus is is saying. You know, for anybody that's saying rural economies are struggling, uh, commodity prices are down. Yes, I can agree to those things, and I want to make sure that people understand how the rural economy is frankly surviving despite the Republicans' best efforts to knock it down. 
when you talk about rural communities many of whom or many of which are represented by our republican colleagues the lifeblood of a county seat the lifeblood of some of these small towns is their school their hospital and their courthouse and these are the things that are frankly in shortest funding right now across the state and it is damaging a lot of these town squares that are situated around their courthouse that might get closed for a certain period of time but the republicans frequently will cite the farm economy and all these other factors as to why we're having deappropriations. If you look at the GDP of Iowa, the farm sector represents about 5% of Iowa's GDP in raw numbers, 5% of Iowa's GDP. And I, the other piece that I'll say is Schedule F farm income. This is how people, if it, they have income that's tied to cattle or livestock or commodities, Schedule F farm income in 2015, the most recent year we have, was $243 million out of about $6.9 billion in revenue. So $243 million of $6.9 billion. That's the share of raw farm income that came to the state in the form of revenue. So those things, yes, they might be slow. They might be a little bit uh, harder off than other parts of the economy. Although they are very important to Iowa's economy, they are by no means the driving force of our state revenues. And it's important to push back on that point because frankly, these rural communities are chugging along the best they can despite what the Republicans are doing to many of the you know, foundational pieces of their economy, the courthouse, the hospital, and the school. I wanna make sure that we also talk about that. We have one follow-up question based on that then. That seems to be a moving target, but I know as legislators, we've received hundreds of emails over the last couple of weeks about some uh, pending legislation that the Republicans are moving forward with that would end most of the renewable energy tax credits and the things that help really to have consumers put that into their, into their property. Uh, so, I mean, they're, they're doing their best right now to at least advance some legislation that would end renewable energy and some of those things that are of interest to homeowners. Um, you know, it's, it's a moving target and something that we just have to watch this year, but. Uh, and you see that the impact of the loss of the backfill has a greater impact? The, the, backfill, the backfill would uh, affect every, in every town and city uh, the same. I mean, if it's phased out over a period of five years, which I think is what they've discussed, uh, that would affect every every city and county. Frankly, it would probably be a little bit harder on rural communities because they're not growing at the same pace as urban areas. You don't have the skills. Right, you're not gonna be able to make that up through right. growth and new homes mm -hmm. and new property tax revenue that comes from elsewhere. Um, a lot of rural communities are just either stagnant in population or losing population, which makes that a lot harder. Tax cut. They'd like to. They'd like to do a one-time tax cut. They're 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 holding those dollars, those federal windfall dollars. They're siphoning them off onto the side, and they're saying we can't touch these because we want to provide tax relief. Um, probably income tax. Uh, it's you. They're using it to fund whatever eventual income tax proposals and tax cuts they they come up with this year. All right, well, thank you so much for being here. And thank you to Representative Hall and all the legislators and all of you. And thank you to all the coalition members. There's about 25 organizations that are part of Moral Mondays Iowa, and we're grateful to each of those organizations as well. Have a fabulous funnel week. <laughs> <laughs>